preaching has always been a controversial and a confrontational activity. Uh, we have so much evidence in our histories where preachers have actually played key roles in the really big debates and big discussions that have raged in our society. Uh, if you're a Brit, uh, you can uh, think of examples uh, like St. Paul's Cross in London, outside St. Paul's Cathedral, which was an assembly place from the 13th century, and where sermons were preached from the 14th century and all the way through the period of the Reformation. It became the most important pulpit for putting forth the views of the Reformation. So much controversy, so much activity that resulted from the preaching that happened there. And of course, the Irish, wherever they went, they caused uproar and controversy. Uh, controversies in Ireland were reflected wherever Irish immigrants went. So back in 1844, for example, there was an uproar in Ireland over the government in Westminster increasing its grant to the Roman Catholic Seminary at Maynooth, just outside Dublin. And that decision by the Westminster government led to anti-Catholic rioting right here in Philadelphia. Can you believe that? At the height of the potato famine in Ireland in the 19th century, the importance of the sermon as an instrument of religious and political controversy was illustrated to an extraordinary degree. Um, two famous sermons delivered on either side of the Atlantic within a week of each other. 28th of February, 1847, a sermon preached in Liverpool was entitled, The Famine, the Rod of God. <coughs> Excuse me, preached by a well-known Anglican, evangelical, the Reverend Hugh McNeil. In accounting for the occurrence of the famine in Ireland, uh, McNeil stressed its providential design, suggested it was God's judgment on the wickedness of the Catholic Irish for persisting in their loyalty to the Church of Rome. Within three weeks, the same theme was taken up in New York City by Catholic Archbishop John Hughes, who explicitly rejected the interpretation of the famine as providential. Instead, he laid the blame at the door of the London government, which chose to let Ireland starve rather than interfere with the workings of the free market. Uh, one commentator says that the archbishop's comments on the morality or the lack of it of this particular policy would have done justice to Karl Marx. Uh, but it's a kind of example of the strength of the links that joined religion and politics in the Irish world across the generations as well as across the oceans. But it was also testimony to the role of the sermon, to the power of preaching in providing a medium through which this particular culture was spread. What I want to suggest to you just in this next hour is that the pulpit and preaching continue to have a significant role in terms of our culture. Whatever the views of the secular and the unbelieving world, for Christian people, the pulpit and preaching <clears throat> remain significant and influential. We in the Reformed tradition have consistently argued that the Word of God, and particularly the hearing a word from God, is at the very center of our worship. The people of God gather each Lord's Day, morning and evening, to hear what the Lord has to say to them and to respond to that Word. The very architecture of our buildings reflects that commitment as the people of God are gathered within hearing distance of the pulpit and the pulpit with its open Bible. And the controversies and challenges in this contemporary age require that we who are called as pastors and preachers work hard at preparing for each Lord's Day so that God's people are fed and led and protected from all the evil and the pernicious propaganda 
to which they are exposed the other six days of the week. <clears throat> you don't need me to tell you that the good news of Jesus Christ is deeply implausible in our Western culture at the current time. It's not that most people have spent hours and hours studying Christianity and have decided that it's just not for them. It's not that they have necessarily had a bad experience of Christians and the church in the past, which has turned them off, although some have. Rather, I think it's the case that the cultural air they have breathed in all their lives has shaped them to assume that Christianity is irrelevant, untrue, and intolerant. And we experience that apathy and that opposition and that rejection in our evangelistic efforts. Jesus and the gospel are so far down people's agenda that the Lord Jesus Christ is not even an option for them to consider, much less one to accept. So when we enter the pulpit each Lord's Day, we're entering a theater of confrontation and of conflict. We're declaring a word from the living God which challenges and which confronts the thinking and the worldview of unbelief. Um, okay, so I'm Irish, I'm not American, but I picked this stuff up um, across the Atlantic. Uh, William Barr, your Attorney General, commented recently on the current state of religion and society. He was heavily criticized by the liberal left for his comments. He said, the secular project has itself become a religion, pursued with religious fervor. It's taking in all the trappings of religion, including inquisitions and excommunication. Those who defy the creed risk a figurative burning at the stake social, educational, and professional ostracism, and exclusion waged through lawsuits and savage social media campaigns. Uh, again, you may want to comment on this afterwards because I'm not quite sure where I am in terms of social commentary, but you know in the aftermath of the Joshua Harris kissing the Christian faith goodbye in July past, and then a high-profile leader in Hillsong also leaving Christianity in August, uh, David French in the National Review made this comment, as our culture changes, secularizes, and grows less tolerant of Christian orthodoxy, I'm noticing a pattern in many of the people who fall away. They're retreating from faith not because they're ignorant of its key tenets and lack the necessary intellectual theological depth, but rather because the adversity of adherence to increasingly countercultural doctrine grows too great. Put another way, the failure of the church isn't so much of catechesis, but of fortification, of building the pure moral courage and resolve to live your faith in the face of cultural headwinds. Well, French is certainly correct in that people are falling away in large part due to a failure of moral courage. There's no question about that. Uh, nevertheless, we might disagree with him that when it comes to catechesis over against fortification, it's actually not an either or, but it's a both and. We can easily fail at catechesis. We can also fail to prepare people for the costly discipleship that's part of being a faithful follower of Christ. And I think it's apparent that both these things are happening at the same time all across evangelicalism. The, co the conflict, the controversy in which we're now engaged is going to threaten the future of some churches. In other words, evangelical churches, evangelical ministries that are awash in pragmatism, that fail to serve up a substantial diet of sound doctrine are not going to be able to maintain their strength. When people have to make a choice between following Christ on the one hand and keeping their job or keeping their friends on the other. The squeeze on cultural Christianity is already underway. And some of those congregations will dwindle and wither and die. The children in those congregations 
may well leave the church in considerable numbers. And some statistics indicate that that may be already happening. The bottom line is that the churches that are actually handing on the faith, in terms of catechesis, and that actually have a disciplined congregation, developing strength and fortitude in terms of mor moral courage, they're the ones that are going to fare best in the days ahead. The future of the others is less certain. Uh, one part of French's article is noteworthy, I think. He says, in my travels around the country, one thing has become crystal clear to me, Christians are not prepared for the social consequences of the profound cultural shifts, especially in the more secular parts of the nation. They're afraid to say what they believe, not because they face the kind of persecution that Christians face overseas, but because they're simply not prepared for any meaningful adverse consequences in their careers or with their peers. The fact is, not only are we as preachers engaged in a conflict, but so are our people. And we need to prepare them so that they can survive the heat and the bruises of the battle. That's a clear part of our calling as pastors and preachers. In the part of the world where I live, uh, we have believed that if we elected politicians with Christian commitments, we would be spared the ravages of secular aggression and the cost of Christian discipleship, but that has not been the case. In Northern Ireland, our local elected assembly had resisted the pressure to legalize abortion and to approve same-sex marriage in spite of the liberalizing trends in the rest of the United Kingdom and in the Republic of Ireland. But now, just on Monday past, the politicians at Westminster and London have, without seeking a mandate from the people of our province, imposed laws that permit both abortion and same-sex marriage. Uh, my friends and colleagues are all over social media expressing their sadness about the dark day that has descended on a region we love so well. In his lecture on the weapons of our warfare, the doctor made the following point. It's a rather controversial point, and, and many of us might like to debate it or discuss it if the doctor were still here. He says, in her attempt to defend the truth and the faith, the church has at times made the mistake of invoking the help and aid and the power of the state and of the law. That came in, of course, he said, as a result of the conversion, so-called, of the Emperor Constantine and of Christianity becoming the official religion of the Roman Empire, and it's continued ever since then. He says, men have used the state and acts of parliament to defend the faith. And whoever therefore did not conform would be thrown into prison, his goods would be taken away from him, and he might perhaps be put to death. You cannot defend the Christian faith, he says, by the power of the state. It's no part of the business of the state to defend Christian truth. The church and state are complementary but essentially distinct spheres. To hide behind acts of parliament, to try to defend your position by shielding yourself behind such acts, seems to me to be guilty of trying to fight the great fight by methods which are entirely carnal. Now, we're into deep theological waters there, waters of political theology, and uh, I know that many of us around Westminster might not just agree exactly with what the doctor said. But the, the, the point is this, overall our Western culture is not trending toward adherence to evangelical beliefs. Approval of same-sex marriage is steadily rising among all religious groups, even evangelicals. Religious affiliation quickly dropping. Support for legal abortion is at an all-time high. Our society does not share our values increasingly we're feeling marginalized. According to a Pew Research Center survey released this year, roughly 50% of Americans believe evangelicals face some or a lot of discrimination. I'm reminded of the words of Dorothy Sayers, writing some time ago where she makes the connection between doctrine and moral behavior. It's worse than useless for Christians to talk about the importance of Christian morality, unless they're prepared to take their stand upon the fundamentals of Christian theology. 
It's a lie to say that dogma does not matter. It matters enormously. It's fatal to let people suppose that Christianity is only a mode of feeling. It's vitally necessary to insist that it is first and foremost a rational explanation of the universe. It's hopeless to offer Christianity as a vaguely idealistic aspiration of a simple and consoling kind. It is, on the contrary, a hard, tough, exacting, and complex doctrine steeped in drastic and uncompromising realism. And it's fatal to imagine that everybody knows quite well what Christianity is and needs only a little encouragement in order to practice it. The brutal fact, she says, is that in this Christian country, not one person in a hundred has the faintest notion what the church teaches about God or man or society or the person of Jesus Christ. Theologically, this country is at present in a state of utter chaos established in the name of religious toleration and rapidly degenerating into a flight from reason and the death of hope. So, what do we do? All of this calls to mind Paul's words to the Ephesian elders in Acts 20, where Paul gives elders and pastors a bit of advice about how to shepherd God's people in the midst of such conflict. You may want to follow. Let me read those verses. From Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called to him the elders of the church, and when they had come to him, he said to them, you yourselves know from the first day that I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord <clears throat> with all humility and with tears and with trials, which came upon me through the plots of the Jews. How I did not shrink from declaring to you anything that was profitable and teaching you publicly and from house to house, solemnly testifying to both Jews and Greeks of repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, behold, bound on the Spirit, I am on my way to Jerusalem, not knowing what will happen to me there, except that the Holy Spirit solemnly testifies to me in every city, saying that bonds and afflictions await me. But I do not consider my life of any account as dear to myself, in order that I may finish my course and the ministry which I received from the Lord Jesus to testify solemnly of the gospel of the grace of God. And now, behold, I know that all of you among whom I went about preaching the kingdom will see my face no more. Therefore, I testify to you this day, I am innocent from the blood of all men, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole purpose of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. Notice Paul's pattern of ministry. He preaches the whole counsel of God, catechesis. And he suffers the consequences from the public authorities while doing so. Paul shepherds and prepares God's people by teaching and by suffering. And we are called to nothing less. Let me make just two points. We should not fail to preach the gospel and Christian truth with energy and commitment. For the three years that Paul was in Ephesus, what did he do? How did he spend his time? He explained and he taught the gospel. As he recounts his ministry among them, he ransacks the Greek vocabulary. He uses a wide range of Greek verbs to describe what he did. Verse 20, he preached or declared anything that would be helpful. He taught them publicly and from house to house. Verse 21, he declared that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, he testified to the gospel of God's grace. Verse 25, he preached the kingdom. Verse 27, he proclaimed the whole will of God. Verse 31, he warned them night and day with tears. Notice all the verbs there, declared, taught, 
preached, testified, proclaimed, warned. In all different kinds of ways, Paul shared and taught the word of God. He was skillful and varied in the use of the spiritual weapon God had placed in his hands. And brothers and sisters, that range of verbs is a reminder to us that this ministry of the word in which we are engaged is a varied and a multifaceted activity. It certainly includes preaching from the pulpit. And we're here for that very reason for these days. But it seems as though every time Paul spoke, he was speaking about God. He was speaking about grace. He was talking about the gospel. He says specifically there in verse 20, he taught them publicly and from house to house. So verse 25 seems to hint that it was not only at the designated formal teaching times, but often informally. As he walked around Ephesus, he preached and shared the word of God. He said in verse 31, the time of day or the time of night didn't matter. He says he never stopped warning them night and day with tears. I think for those of us engaged in pastoral ministry, that's a very important point to remember. In pastoral visitation, in private counsel, in small groups as well as large groups, in discussions and conversations, formally, informally, we minister the word at all times and in different ways. We're seeking to counteract this pernicious propaganda that prevails in our culture. That the task of ministry is multivalent, is not restricted to pulpit ministry. And Paul was ready to share the word with whoever would listen. In verse 21, he says, he has the same message for people, whether they're Jews or Gentiles. He would preach and minister to anyone who would listen. No one was excluded. And he undertook that ministry with courage. He refused to flinch or hold back, even when what he was saying was hard to hear. I think that little phrase, I have not hesitated to preach or proclaim to you the whole counsel of God, indicates that there may have been some consumer resistance to his message. He might have been tempted to dilute it. He might have been tempted to massage it or to adjust it. But the nature of his audience didn't put him off. He was fully committed to the gospel, reminding us that the task of ministry, preaching and pastoral ministry, requires patience and perseverance and courage. And in this work of the ministry, God brings all kinds of different people across our path. We're in touch with people in different contexts, different situations. Sometimes it's a time of rejoicing, celebration. Other times it's a time of sadness and tragedy. Sometimes hearts are open. Other times there's resistance and hardness. Sometimes it's easy. Many times it can be hard and difficult. But in every situation... People need to be instructed and supported and guided by what God says. And that's why gospel ministry requires a flexibility. It requires an adaptability. It requires a creativity so that in all kinds of ways, by all possible means, at all times, we may speak of our Lord Jesus Christ. We use large groups and small groups. We speak in homes, in stores, in shops, in the workplace, and in all kinds of recreational situations. We look to create opportunities in our church buildings and in the wider community for the truth of God's word to be spoken. We take advantage of every situation <clears throat> and of every encounter so that people may hear and respond to Christ. In, in verse 24, Paul's using his Olympic Games metaphor. However, he says, I consider my life worth nothing to me if only I may finish the race. If only I may complete the task the Lord Jesus has given me. The task of testifying 
to the gospel of God's grace. And I can't think of a clearer statement of the purpose of Christian ministry. Can't think of a clearer statement of what our central responsibility is in the work of the kingdom. It is this task to testify to the gospel of God's grace. Oh, I keep forgetting about this. John, I need to tighten up a bit here um, and learn how to use this. Um, it's a wonderful facility. Uh, and the outcome of all of this kind of ministry is that it protects and shepherds the flock. Paul is clear that his spiritual flock is exposed to danger. And he instructs the elders to care for and to protect the flock. Keep watch over yourselves. All the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Our brother sharing at the alumni lunch was very clear when he was asked, what's the, the role of an elder? It's to feed the flock and to slay the wolves. The interesting point here, which Paul makes, is that these savage wolves are noted for their teaching. In verse 30, he says they twist or distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. The battle for the flock is a battle of ideas. These wolves are teachers who profess to offer an alternative truth which is really a distortion of the truth. And the way to refute twisted things is by teaching straight and accurate things. Notice how Paul demonstrates the way to fight off the wolves. His immediate response to this discussion of the wolves and their attack on the flock is to again point to his example of teaching and instruction in verse 31. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. In the face of apostasy, in the face of heresy, in face of false teaching, preaching, and the ministry of the word are so crucial. It includes warnings. Paul says he warned them. It includes emotion. He warned them with tears. And it includes urgency. He warned them day and night. So a word-centered, gospel-centered ministry not only feeds and nourishes the flock, but it defends them, it protects them. And in our age, where many and diverse religions and philosophies and ideas abound, our churches, our flocks need to be well taught and well instructed in the truth of the gospel. They need to be catechized. They need to be fortified. Or else they're not going to survive. There's a second point here. This is my final point I want to make. We should be exemplary in terms of our courage, affection, and integrity. <clears throat> in one of the reports to our General Assembly, a couple of years ago, our Youth and Children's Board reported that young people within the Presbyterian Church in Ireland said very clearly when they were asked that, yes, they wanted to be instructed and taught the Bible. They wanted to have a really good grasp of what we Presbyterians believe. But even more than that, <coughs> they said they longed to have an example set before them of what it means to trust and follow Jesus Christ. Uh, there was a somber mood in the assembly when that report was received because it was very insightful and very challenging and one that the assembly needed to respond to. So I don't know what it's like in your fellowship or your denomination, but whatever else we preachers set ourselves to do, we're going to have to provide good and godly leadership to everyone in our churches and congregations, but especially to our young people. All the members of our congregations need good role models for confident and courageous Christian living, but our young people particularly in this current atmosphere 
are crying out for that. How am I going to live for Jesus, given all that's happening in my world? And this is not a novel idea. Christian ministry, gospel ministry, has always had this as its clear goal. Ministers and elders must be people of character and affection and integrity who relate to the people whom they lead by setting them an example of Christian discipleship. We, oh, this is so basic, isn't it? We're called to be followers of Jesus ourselves. We're called to disciple others in the same direction by leading the way by setting them an example. And we must be ready and able to teach and to help them with regard to understanding God's truth and God's word. And both these emphases, that of exemplary and courageous character on the one hand, that of teaching and instruction on the other, are present here in this passage in Acts 20. And for those of us who are called to ministry, then Paul provides for us here <clears throat> what we can only describe as an inspired philosophy of ministry. He says there in verse 24, I consider my life worth nothing that I may finish the race and complete the task. He explained to the Ephesian elders what the task of ministry looks like, and he provided this apostolic pattern for leadership and ministry. And Paul speaks often about the importance of both character and affection. He roots spiritual influence in the leader's integrity. Notice the you know expressions and the you know comments, which Paul makes there in verses 18 to 21. You know how I lived the whole time I was with you. You know that I've not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you. And he repeats it again in verse 34. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. There's an authenticity. There's a sincerity. There's a reality about the apostle's character that was evident and plain and observable. More than any other profession or calling, Christian ministry is about who you are rather than what you can do. And allied to that was the whole quality of his relationship with the people. He loved them so much, so affectionately was he connected to them that he wept for them. He says, I served the Lord with great humility and with tears. Verse 31 again, remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. Why was he crying? Why was he moved? Because he loved these folks. His ministry was discharged in the context of example and affectionate engagement with his people. And that's exactly the same context and attitude we need to adopt in our ministry and our preaching ministry and our pastoral ministry. There's to be a love and affection for those to whom we minister. And congregations are so quick to pick up on whether or not their minister loves them whether or not he cares for them. And sometimes we who are ministers fail to act and speak in a way that communicates that warm affection, that desire for their welfare and for their growth and grace. It's such a simple thing, but in pastoral ministry, I find myself having to be constantly reminded of this basic fact. My congregation is not my enemy. Uh, I'm at the stage in life where I get called into all kinds of presbytery commissions and assembly commissions for, for their problems and difficulties in congregations. And there's a, a senior elder who has sat on some of these commissions with me. And he has said at times when we have explored the details of what's going on in a congregation, he says, does the minister not realize that one of his jobs is to be a friend to his people? It's a very folksy kind of way of putting it. But there's a great truth in that. I'm called to love them as my friends and my family. Encourage them, care for them, support them. Unfortunately, when some of us were younger in the ministry, we saw all the shortcomings in the church. We saw all the inconsistencies. We saw all the imperfections. And we scolded far too much 
that can be so easy to do and we still do it. Uh, I remember an uncle of my wife's telling me that they had a new young minister in their congregation and he was exposing all that was wrong and all the failures and things they weren't doing right in their personal lives and the life of the congregation. He says, I really expected them just to reach down under the, uh, the reading desk and pull out an automatic submachine gun and just spray us all. That's what he felt about us, I thought. And it's easy to do that. But our calling is to see people grow and develop and mature. And that comes as we care for them and as we love them. It brings me back to one of the great themes of Dr. Lloyd-Jones's lectures on preaching. The importance of personal holiness. The importance of godly motivations in the life of the preacher. Uh, I think John Piper's book, Contending for Our All, makes the point powerfully. Uh, I've referred to it previously, and it has been so beneficial to me personally. He says that some controversy is crucial for the sake of life-giving truth. Running away from it is a sign of cowardice. I've referred to this already. But enjoying it, he says, is usually a sign of pride. I love this statement. Humility loves truth-based unity more than truth-based victory. We don't love to fight. Sometimes we have to fight because we know that the issue of Christ is at stake. And we know and we love Christ so much, we want to proclaim him. We enter the battle in order to ensure that Christ remains central and that he, because we know he is the path to everlasting life and joy. But do you remember how Machen put it? He says, controversy of the right sort is good. For out of such controversy as church history and scripture alike teach, there comes the salvation of souls. When you believe that soul-saving truth is at stake in a controversy, running away from it is not only cowardly, it is actually cruel. Our love for Christ, our love for his church, means that we engage in the battle. But we do so in a spirit of love and humility, a desire for unity in the truth. Uh, Piper points us to John Owen, the great Puritan intellect, as an example of someone who, in, in engaging in controversy, was driven by a manifest love for Christ and a desire for his glory. For Owen, virtually every confrontation with error was for the sake of the contemplation of Christ. He held that contemplation of Christ, communion with Christ, were only possible by means of true views and right doctrine about Christ. He says, then we have communion with God in the doctrines we contend for. When we have communion with God in the doctrines we contend for, then shall we be garrisoned by the grace of God against all the assaults of men. Our danger, I think we recognize this, that we're prone to preach without pressing into the things we're saying, without making them real to our own souls. I don't know, the longer I go on in ministry, it can get a bit easier. That we find words come easily, that we can speak of the great mysteries of the faith without standing in awe of them. We can speak about purity <coughs> and the desire for purity in the lives of our people without being pure ourselves. We can describe the sinfulness of sin we can talk about the horrors of corruption without any genuine and heartfelt sorrow for our own sin. We call others to live a life of holiness without trembling at our own lack of holiness. The conviction that controlled Owen was this. A man preaches that sermon only well unto others, which preacheth itself in his own soul, and he that doth not feed on and thrive in the digestion of the food which he provides for others will scarce make it savory unto them. Yea, he knows not, but the food he hath provided may be poison, unless he have really tasted of it in himself. If the word doth not dwell with power in us, it will not pass with power from us. It was this conviction that sustained Owen in his busy life of controversy and conflict. When he undertook to defend the truth, 
He sought, first of all, to take that truth deeply into his heart, to gain a real spiritual experience of it, so that there would be no artificiality in the debate, no mere posturing, no mere gamesmanship. He was fortified, he was steady in the battle, because he had come to experience the truth at the personal level in terms of his own sanctification. Uh, here's the way, again, he put it uh, in the preface to the mystery of the gospel vindicated. 1655, he says, when the heart is cast indeed in the mold of the doctrine that the mind embraceth, when the evidence and necessity of the truth abides in us, when not the sense of the words only is in our heads, but the sense of the thing abides in our hearts, then we have communion with God in the doctrine we contend for. Then shall we be garrisoned by the grace of God against all the assaults of men. And you know the key phrase there, when we have communion with God in the doctrine we contend for. Uh, our friend Sinclair says that everything Owen wrote for his contemporaries had a practical and a pastoral aim in view, namely the promotion of true Christian living. Owen's concern for godly living extended to the university, it extended to parliament. Uh, Peter Toon says that Owen's special emphasis was to insist that the whole academic curriculum be submerged in preaching and catechizing and prayer. He wanted graduates of Oxford to be proficient in the arts and sciences, but also to aspire after godliness. Uh, that theme was repeated in his sermons to Parliament. He based it on the Old Testament model that the people of Israel prospered when their leaders were godly. He believed that the spread of the gospel should be accompanied and advanced by lives of eminent holiness. When he came back from Ireland in 1650, after he had seen the English forces under Cromwell decimate the Irish people, he preached to Parliament and called for another kind of warfare. He says, how is it that Jesus Christ is in Ireland only as a lion staining all his garments with the blood of his enemies, and none to hold him out as a lamb sprinkled with his own blood to his friends. Is this to deal fairly with the Lord Jesus? Call him out to do battle and then keep away his crown. God hath been faithful in doing great things for you. Be faithful in this one. Do your utmost for the preaching of the gospel in Ireland. That last phrase is still one that some of us hold on to. We're doing our utmost for the preaching of the gospel in Ireland and all across the world. On the occasion of his funeral, David Clarkson, who had been his pastoral associate in the later years of his ministry, said this, a great light has fallen, one of eminency for holiness, learning, parts and abilities, a pastor, a scholar, a divine of the first magnitude. Holiness gave a divine luster to his other accomplishments. It shined in his whole course and was diffused through his whole conversation. So here's our challenge, dear friends. To be so committed to the gospel, to be so committed to the glory of Christ that we give ourselves body and soul to the task of teaching and preaching to what the apostle calls testifying to the grace of the gospel. And we do it with hearts that so love the Savior and so love his people that they see Christ-like grace and love and courage in us so that they are enthused and energized to follow him in loyal obedience. Amen.